Tube socks, tube socks, please fight out. Please fight out. Please fight out. Hi, I'm Spike Lee, but I'm not directing. I do this. It pays the rent, puts food on the table, butter on my whole wheat bread. Anyway, I had this new comedy coming out. It's a very funny show. She's got to have it. Check this out. My first impressions of Nola, darling, insatiable. There's a girl that I once knew who often had a friend or two. She gave them time of waiting rhymes sublime. As a sex-positive polyamorous pansexual, monogamy never even seemed like a remote possibility. Doesn't it get confusing <sighs> juggling all of them at the same time? I'm used to knowing what I want in relationships and in my art, but lately I'm just so confused. So tell me a little bit about the men in your life. Oh, God. <laughs> Mars makes me laugh until my sides hurt. <laughs> yeah. Greer is spontaneous. Nothing is ever the same with him. Jamie's grown, and he cares about me in a way that no one ever has. Your name leaves my lips the moment I wake from slumber. <laughs> She's juggling a lot. Men, ambitions. We can't all be like Nola Day and three hot dudes at once. Hey. If you were obstacles, you just drive your car. Cause one monkey don't stop the show. And little Mary's bad. I gotta look within to feel what makes me happy. You're a real talent. <laughs> to my beautiful friends. <laughs> my baby girl. I think Nola's a freak. I'm not a freak. You're a sex addict. I'm not a sex addict. Excuse me, miss. Hey, boo. Baby girl. And I'm damn sure nobody's property. My name is Nola Darling. This is so amazing. That just makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, well, watching the show made me so happy too. As a huge sort of Spike Lee fan, specifically those first, you know, like four or five films that he made, you know, Crooklyn and Back, really. Like, you, this encapsulates that vibe so beautifully. For and sure. It's a number of 25, 30 minute episodes that you just get to sit and be in that Spike Lee world. For sure. Also, we get him back. Yeah. Like, we get him back for our generation again. This is something brand new for him. This is something brand new for us to see from him. Yeah. This is so exciting. Like, this is a first of Spike Lee that never happens. And that's such an interesting thing that you just said, which is uh, we get him back for our generation. Because even though this is about a different generation than the She's Got to Have of the 80s, what you have is him grappling with the stories, the ideas, the mm -hmm. feelings of this particular generation with the history of the generation before. For sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think one of the coolest things about this is, you know, sometimes when you do adaptations of movies or other things from the past, you kind of struggle with how to make it new again, how to make it fresh again. The mere fact that it was 31 years ago, you would think that that would be fresh enough. But the cool thing about a 10 episode series is that you get to really delve into all of these characters and you get all of their backstories and a little bit about them that you wouldn't get in a movie Anyways, it doesn't matter if it was 31 years ago or today, you just wouldn't get it in two hours and a half or two hours and 15 minutes, but you really get to have it in 30 minutes for 10 episodes. So you really get like a piece of everything. So as a viewer, you get to watch and you're like, oh, I'm a little bit of Shemekha or, oh, I'm a little bit of Mars or, oh, I'm a little bit of, you know, so everybody kind of gets their little piece of their character as in the movie, you just kind of get to meet them for the first time. Right, in the movie you get like three characters, in this you get yeah. the neighborhood. You yeah. get what feels like a great representation of Fort Greene, and Fort Greene is, you know, uh, where his office is. It's, this is very mm -hmm. much... A Sometimes where we stayed a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was like a lot of our mornings was uh, having meetings at, at Spike's 40 Acres in a Mule office. Um, and a lot of my mornings were, were Fort Greene every single day. We were in the park, we were in the, you know, it was, it was Fort Greene every day. And that's where he feels most comfortable. I mean, it feels like a very deep-rooted Spike Lee movie. I think if he were here, he would argue all of my movies are that. Stop <laughs> discounting a few of them. For sure. And I would totally understand that. But there is something about this show and sitting and binging it and just feeling like you are steeped in Spike Lee love. Yeah, I mean, I think... That's also, so this is my first time on Netflix, which is super exciting. Uh, I think one of the m most amazing things is 
in one day at one time universally, we're in 190 countries. I mean, that's phenomenal and also mind blowing at the same time. But people in Brazil will be able to know how Brooklynites and Fort Greeners live. Yeah, they're going to be in such a specific place. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. They're going to think like, oh my God, what is this land? And, you know, and think that it's like this world. Meanwhile, like all of us New Yorkers are like, oh my God, this is Fort Greene. You know, like that's been that way. And people from here and from Fort Greene, they're like, what happened to our Fort Greene? So it's all of these different shades kind of showing and, and I don't know, shining light on something that might have been, was, and is. And I think Spike does it. Uh, I think he does it perfectly. Talk about your character uh, in the show. She's sort of Nola's best friend and kind, or Nola's very close friend, and I would say more the more responsible or seemingly responsible. Seemingly, where, where I'm at in the show, seemingly <laughs> responsible. Of yeah. The show. Uh, well, it's fun because in the original, Joali, Spike's sister, played Clorinda Bradford, and she was a musician. She was her old roommate. She was her best friend. Um, in this adaptation, she is still her old roommate. They have a falling out. Um, she's still her best friend, but she is a curator. You know, her, her dream is to create a gallery that is completely African diastopian art. You know, like she just wants to be totally engrossed with that. And, um, and I think she keeps, I mean, she keeps Nola around for a lot of different reasons, but she's very, she's very uh, buttoned up and she's very structured. So Nola, having this kind of artistic lifestyle and having these multiple partners and kind of this like f freedom in her personal life, she keeps her around for those moments because Clorinda can never do that. She can never let her hair loose enough to do that and to have the confidence to do that. Nola might not know what she wants, but she's so unapologetic about it. And she just takes such strength and confidence in everything that she does. And I think there's a piece of Clorinda that's a little bit jealous and envious of that. Um, she really hides behind her work and hides behind her structure. And Nola just doesn't hide behind anything. So she, she just lives through her best friend. What was it like working with Spike? I mean, he's brilliant. To say, I, I heard somebody say this once before and it totally makes sense. But when you, when you talk about a genius, you know, uh, that word seems so silly to say about him because he's so much more than that. Um, He's just, he's a dad, he's a friend, he's a captain, he's a director. He literally will be filming a scene, cut the scene, talk to somebody else, his assistant, about locations for tomorrow, then talk to costumes and say, can you change that shirt, please? That doesn't make sense. And then talk to props and say, get that painting out. And then talk to somebody else and then give us notes and then go into the next scene and then set up the next shot. He's unreal and he just doesn't even blink twice. Well, he's one of those, he's been doing this for so long. I mean, it's, it's second nature for him, I bet, to be direct, to be captain. I guess, set, you know? but like, I've totally met people that have been directing for a lifetime and there's something about him. You're there's still a, frazzled. You know what I mean? Like, there's still like, yeah. every crew member is kind of like, oh God, you know, oh geez. Uh, but with Spike, everybody just respects him. They just do it and they don't ask any questions because they know that they're going to get the best shot if they just listen to him. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that he is an icon, so to be able to sit in front of him and work for him and have him build a shot around you is, I mean, I never thought that that was gonna happen for me. What is it like to be part of a, a, a project like this that, um, as, let me find the best way to phrase this as a, as, as a white dude, uh, that is not just about black pride, but is also about female black pride and empowerment. And it's like really beautiful. And you forget that Spike can be so good at this mm -hmm. when, he, when, when he's done it, but this specifically feels like new territory for, sure. for him. But what is it like to be a part of a project like that? Well, I think he's always done a really beautiful job of showing all the shades, especially of brown. Uh, I come from a biracial background, so I'm not fully black, I'm not fully white. Um, but when I did this project and when I took this project and this job, I didn't feel like I was a black actress getting a job, um, nor did I feel like I was a biracial actress getting a job. I felt like he was telling a story from a female's perspective. And I think that his wife has a lot to do with that. Uh, Tanya is really the reason why we're here you know, she was the one that kept bugging her husband to start a TV series about this. There's very rare TV series or shows or any kind of movies or anything that showcases female empowerment and also female support. 
you rarely see females supporting each other, no matter what skin color you are. And this show does it so beautifully. There's nothing that anything, anybody is breaking anybody down. It's just everybody has each other's backs and everybody supports each other. They want the best for each other. That's the kind of females that I see in my everyday life. That's, those are my friends. You know, my friends and I, we don't, we don't try to pull things from each other. We don't try to break each other down. That's not how women are really depicted in real life. That's just some, something that people cash in because it's really easy to put that on women and because why? They're so meek. You know, but generally it's finally people, happening. Generally people notice when a friend has started to become like that. For or sure, and they like back that. off. You like, oh, you know, and you're like, oh, it's time to put you on the cutting block. You know? like hanging out with that person. They're kind of a dick. Right, like absolutely. You, you just get it, it in your gut and then whenever that happens, you're like, oh, that person is like not right for me. That's right. definitely not going to work in my favor. But for the most part, like your friend's kind of support you, you know, and you stick that around, but you don't see that on screen and especially with black women. So I think that he did a beautiful job with it. I think it's really important that we start kind of sharing that story because there's a lot more intelligent, strong women than I know than there are meek. And I think with, uh, with the character of Nola Darling in this, in this show, she is also talking about a lot of the things that uh, the culture is talking about right now. I mean, the broad, the broad culture overall, overall are, are talking about right now, which is objectification, women's bodies, uh, Black Lives Matter. These are things that the show tries to address and also address in really fun, surprising ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I don't want to give a spoiler alert, uh, so I'm going to try to tread lightly. So excuse me if this sounds a little weird, but uh, there's a scene that it's post- the election. Mm -hmm. um, well, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm not like going to say anything. Um, but there definitely is a scene that's post the election, and, um, and it's very relevant in how we were all feeling. And Spike thought it was really necessary to put it in. And there's things like that. Like, there's another scene that is, there was an assault that happens in the series, and it, it kind of affects Nola and everybody that she is connected to and you see how it does and you see how her relationships are affected, how her art is affected and how her personal is affected and how her confidence is. And I think just like all of these little snippets into everyday life, into like what could really happen or what is, uh, nobody's talking like that. And I don't understand why we're not having this conversation. And this is exactly the time to, like you said, this, is, this, this comes at the perfect time. I think what's so smart about the the assault that happens in in this show as well is that it's not um, it doesn't go that far. It's a horrible thing that happens and it's traumatic. But part of the conversation that it approaches, I mean, it, it because you get to see the trauma that happens from what a lot of people would kind of be like, oh, well, why don't you get over that? And it's like, no, this is a real trauma that people actually have to get over, even if it is in somebody's opinion who's never experienced it minor in some way. For sure, and I think uh, it might not go that far seemingly that far but it it didn't take that much yeah. to get there you know she literally just walked out of her house and was walking down a street as a woman I at agree. night so that's something that women deal with all the time especially in this city we're hopping on the subway we're trying to get home you know if we can't get into an uber or we can't afford a taxi or somebody isn't picking us up we're gonna hop into a subway and we're gonna go home and we're gonna hope for the best, and that's crazy that women even have to hope for the best when they leave a club or a bar and they just wanna get home safely and that's all they're asking for is just not to get assaulted. That's insane. So for that to just be a conversation and for that to be something that he brought up or something that he felt was really necessary, I think it's beautiful. I think I, I agree and I think the reason that it, it gets to become such a great conversation is because it didn't go any mm -hmm. further than you would normally expect, I think, from television and yeah. from movies. Yeah, he stopped it right in time, but it was, I mean, it was enough, it was perfect. And even for uh, Spike himself, he said that the assault scene that happens in the original She's Gotta Have It movie is his one regret as a storyteller. Yeah. And it seems in, in a lot of ways that this She's Gotta Have It, while is paying homage, is also in conversation with a lot of the elements from that movie as well. Yeah, I think, uh you are not Spike Lee, so there's a lot of stuff maybe you might not be able to answer. For sure, yeah, I'm just like his vessel. Um, no, he'd kill me. Um, but I think the really cool thing is Spike, and again, I might be totally speaking out of line, but Spike 31 years ago, and we talked about this a little bit, was college Spike, you know? First film Spike. Uh, 31 years is a very long time. Five years is a long time in this industry. 
31 years is a lifetime. So I think he's listened and I think he's learned and I think he's watched. And with the partnership of his incredible, strong wife, uh, she was able to sit him back and say, no, baby, this is how a woman actually moves and talks. And he sat back and listened and he's totally open-minded and he made it happen in this version. And I think that this is like the best version that he made. There's another person uh, heavily involved, I mean, his wife and him but that's involved, and that's Lynn Nottage, who's written a number of the scripts. And if anybody doesn't know, she's the Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright uh, of Sweat, Sweat which, and Ruined, yeah, and ruined, yeah uh, um, that she won last year. She's incredible. What was it like to get scripts that she'd written to, to work with her? I mean, the first, uh, the first table reading that we had, um, Spike likes to do this thing, and maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this too, <laughs> but uh, he likes to hold us hostage a little bit. So, and it, it's done with the best of intentions, and I, I never thought that as an actor or actress I would be held hostage by Spike Lee. That's pretty cool to say, in my opinion. Um, so for the table read, we went into his studio in Fort Greene, and, uh, and we read through all 10 episodes. Um, that takes a while, yeah. you know, um, especially when people are not really set as their parts. There were still people that were kind of interchanging and wow. all of the scene directions were read as well. So it, it just takes a while to read a script, even th a 30 minute episode. Uh, that's 30 pages, 10 episodes is 300 pages. That's Yeah, it's a long day. Yeah, yeah it's a long day. Uh, so we went in and we didn't really know anybody uh, or each other. Some of us have worked together. I I've known Ilfanesh Hedera, who plays Opal in it, for a while. Um, but that was really in, in China Lane as well. We did Barbershop together. But that was like, those were like the only two girls that I knew. Dewanda I'd seen around. Um, Lyric I met at one point, but like, that was like it. I saw Anthony in Hamilton. Um, but we didn't really know each other. And by the end of the day, we definitely did. But in the beginning of that reading, directed by Spike Lee and then written by Lynn Nottage or Issa Davis or Rada Blank or Sinke Lee or Joa Lee, or like anybody. It was just overwhelming. And luckily in the moment, it didn't hit me like uber hard because I would have totally like lost my mind. Um, and because we just like had to keep our stamina up. Uh, but we were like sitting in, a, in a, like a big square and just kind of looking at each other. And Spike was just like sitting there just looking at everybody and he was just watching everybody. And that's intense alone, you know? Um, and that was probably my second time, second or third time even seeing him. My first time was our our meeting, our, our like first intro, third, uh, second time was my audition and the third time was the read. But it was so intense, but reading those names, it was just like celebrity after it, stunner after, yeah. like icon after, it was just, it's crazy. And these are all people at his fingertips, which speaks a lot about who, who Spike is, because that's who wants to work with him. Uh, you're also in another show right now as well, right? I am, yeah. You're I'm in, in Blue, Blue Bloods. Bloods. Yeah. What, what's going on there? Uh, it's cool. I get to be a cop again, which is fun. Right. You've done it before, right? I've done it before. Um, this time she has braids instead of curly hair, oh. which is cool. Uh, but um, it's very, very fun. Uh, I, I got that role um, a couple months ago, and I get to play with Donnie Wahlberg a little bit, and we get to have fun and kind of bust some uh, bad guys and, yeah, lots of punches and action and <laughs> fear stuff. Yeah, I get, is it a fun I get show to wear a suit again. Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, they're in their eighth season, yeah. which is so crazy. Your uh, job as a, as, a, as a guest star on that at this point is to, like, come in and don't make the day longer for us. You know what's so wild is I feel like sometimes being an actor uh, – it's a super weird job, anyways. Very strange, uh, it's weird what we do. But, but also, like, we get to basically put on clothes and just play imagination all day um, and play dress up. But one of the things about coming on, like, later in your seasons, you get to come on and it's basically like walking into a school after you've moved. Everybody already has their friends for the year. You walk into the lunchroom, everybody's sitting with their tables. It's like the cool kids and the punks and the skaters and the, you know, I don't know if that's how school is anymore. Clearly, I haven't been in it for a while. Um, but, you know, everybody has their little cliques. And it's the same thing when you come on in a really long, episodic 
show, like season eight, uh, you're the newbie and everybody's already made their friends. Nobody really wants to make any friends. So you just kind of have to play along and you just have to jump right in. There was no lag time. Uh, there is no warm up, and they expect a lot from you. And um, I, I really think that that's a challenge that I, I love. So that excites yeah, that's me. It's fun, right? It's super fun. Yeah, that's it's like... super nerve wracking too. It's depending on however you take it. Um, you can either have like a total nervous breakdown or you can just like be like, oh, yeah, we're gonna do this. Yeah. And then there's like no turning back. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a question? Hi. So this is a question I'm going to ask you that I'm asking a lot of my friends lately. And um, it goes like, so we all have this uh, notion of supporting one another as females. But yet, I feel like it doesn't necessarily translate in most places. And you don't actually see tangible change of feminism among females. So um, you have friends who support you, which is great, but I just, it's not everywhere. So what do you think it's going to take to actually feel the support of one another as females in the long run? I think it's gonna take us to change it. I, I know that that sounds like a super lame answer, but change doesn't really happen overnight. That's shown in history. Uh, this is something that will continue to happen every single day. I think that the initial change can happen within your friends. If that's not something that is really happening right now with your girlfriends, you start the change. Or if those girlfriends are not supporting you, then you change your girlfriends. Um, you shouldn't be with people that don't support you and don't encourage everything that you do. Uh, if you have a passion about something, you should have friends that give you that gift back and really support you back. Um, luckily, I do have girlfriends that do that, but I really, I've, I've been really lucky finding strong women and I just gravitate toward strong women because that keeps me strong. I know that that's a gift that they give me without being like a, a gift that they have to buy. That's something that is, is priceless that I get year round. So that's something that I need to continue daily, to continue to inspire other people and be strong for myself and other things and also embody different women like this woman, Clorinda Bradford, in this show and continue on so that other people can watch me on screen and say, she supports her girlfriends, maybe I should too. So it really happens at home and happens first in ourselves. We have to have the confidence and strength within ourselves to then give it to somebody else and then it continues on just like a ripple effect. I think that that's how it's gonna happen. Next question. Hi. Hey. Um, I know you were talking about empowerment earlier, so I wanted to ask, like, who are the people that you look up to for strength or inspiration? Uh, I look up to my mom and my dad. Um, my family is very, very close. Uh, I'm lucky enough that my parents are together and they heavily support me and they always have. I know that that's kind of an anomaly, but um, I'm very, very happy that, that that happened. I can call both of them my best friends. My father has worked for everything that he's gotten. He came from another country. He came from Jamaica and was an immigrant at 16. Uh, my mother comes from a family of immigrants, all from Germany and Russia descent. And, uh, and they all worked for what they needed as well. They're both intelligent. They instilled education in me. And they constantly just try to remind me to stay grounded and humbled and strong no matter how many people can bring you down because we live in a society that everybody wants to. So um, those are my two heroes, yeah. I think we have time for one more question right here. Hi, um, so you were saying before how this show tackles issues that are super relevant to society today, and I was wondering how you go about preparing for those kind of scenes with that in your mind. I think when you don't think at when you don't think about everything at large because I think sometimes it can be really overwhelming to go into a scene and be like we have to change the world today um, it's not going to happen uh, but you can go into the scene with honesty and passion and um, and just try your best to be there and really connect to it as best as you can and hope that maybe one person that watches it out of 10 could connect with you and, and that's how I, I think it just kind of gravitates off screen. But I definitely don't go in with like, I used to go in with like the big bubble of having that responsibility to take it all and um, that's not realistic. That's just not gonna happen. I'm not a superhero and I definitely know that. I'm just an actor. So I just try to take the words as best as I can and try to have them touch something that's true for me and have that read on screen. I wonder if it's more or less difficult when you're doing a period piece, like 
boardwalk empire, and you can look at the sort of cultural context, the historical context of that scene, and still trying to focus on exactly what that character would feel in that moment and try to let go of the historical context versus something like this where, uh, sure, it's addressing a lot of issues, but you know you can just think about how that issue is affecting that person that you're playing in that scene. Yeah, I guess it's it's harder and not as hard. Not as hard because I I don't necessarily there's there's nobody in the 1920s that are still around that I can ask how did you feel being a black singer on stage selling out a club but not being able to walk in the front door. Um, I, can't, I couldn't ask somebody like that, but I could only imagine how it would feel to be like that and to be alone. Um, but in this scenario, we're living in this and a lot of people are gonna be watching this uh, and we're gonna be setting the stage for a new generation that's never seen the old, she's gotta have it. So that's a lot of pressure to be able to um, stand for a character. And also everybody's gonna feel their own way about how Clarinda is. A lot of people are gonna not like her. Um, I'm totally ready for that too. Uh, most of my characters that I played, a lot of people don't like me, so I'm ready for that. But that just also makes me know that I did my job well. So it kind of comes with a halfway, halfway point. Um, this was also easy because these, all of the people in this cast I love and adore and they're like my family. Uh, and the other one, I, I didn't know everybody as much and that was going on their fourth season and everybody was already in it. So I had to really fend for myself and then I was against, I was with Jeffrey Wright who is like another icon, you know. Yeah. I don't know Jeffrey Wright. Uh, I was terrified to just shake his hand until he made a joke and then I still got chills, you know. So it's it all kind of comes with the plus and minuses and um, a little bit of the burdens along the way, but I'm kind of ready for it all. Um, Margo, uh, the She's Gotta Have It is premiering Thanksgiving Day. Uh, yeah, so after you eat some turkey, just yeah. sit and binge. Binge it, it's wonderful. <laughs> and Blue Bloods is on what night on CBS? The next day. The next, oh, okay, Friday. so Friday night, watch Blue Bloods. So if you don't get enough of me on Thursday, just turn me on on Friday. Margo Bingham, everybody, round of applause. <laughs>